بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. This is brother Ijaz. جزاه الله خير. Very beautiful recitation. Make dua that Allah helps him to, يعني to improve in terms of his recitation. I mean, and to, in شاء الله, to make him among one of the reciters of the Quran, and to give him and give us all ikhlas. Brother Ijaz. MashaAllah, Jazallah Khair, he is concerned about uh, or he puts attention to a few things. One of them is the movement of Rawafid and another thing he likes, he likes the reciters. And he asked me to speak about Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, Rahimahullah, who passed away last Saturday. And then I said to myself, the best one to speak about the Shaykh Rahimahullah is the one who loves him the most. I used to love the Shaykh, but I didn't know him as Brother Ijaz did. So he sent me a few clips and articles about the Shaykh. And I strongly believe that if you don't speak from your heart, then it's not the, 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 the best way to speak. Yeah. So I leave it to Brother Ijaz to talk to you, yeah, about to talk to all of us about Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Um, like I said once already, um, I never really thought Sheikh was going to put me on the spot like this, but alhamdulillah, inshallah, we can share some beneficial words about the life of Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, I started listening to the Sheikh, I think, a long time ago, just when I first started practicing. And my own connection with the Sheikh is quite emotional. It's because it was at a time in my life when I was going through a lot of change. And so his voice and not really knowing much about Arabic at the time and just hearing the emotion in his voice really made me wonder, subhanAllah, why is he reciting it in that way? Why did he recite that verse in that way? Why did... In this part of the verse, he recited like that, and then his voice went sad. And he was like, I found that, subhanAllah, he was a master of qara'ah, and he was a master of emotion in the way that he reflected what he was reciting perfectly. Um, so that, it, it was, you know, alhamdulillah, I have a, that was like an emotional connection in my life. And I think the life of the sheikh, there are so many examples we can, we can take from him. Right from his earliest um, upbringing, he was born in Mecca. Uh, Mecca and Saudi Arabia and from a very young age he was immersed in learning the Quran he was he wasn't Arab uh, as many of you know he was Burmese and his family fled the oppression in Burma from a uh, from a from a long time ago so he was quite young when they when they, when they moved to Mecca and um, during his early years his father rahimahullah he was involved in um, trying to get as many refugees from Burma out of Burma and into Saudi Arabia um, and he sort of got caught up with the government at the time and it was his methods weren't entirely legal and he spent some time in prison and so during that early part of the sheikh's life his father was in prison and while his father was in prison um, he himself was the eldest of his siblings so he had to do two things he had to a support his family and support his, his siblings and also b he would go and memorize quran at his masjid and the sheikh mentions in an interview that between his home and between the masjid in which he memorized the Quran every single day, there were two mountains, like two hills. And you have to remember, this is 1960s Mecca, Mecca in the 1960s. So you had very few, you had roads, but not that many, and not nothing like it is today. And you don't have any of the, the tunnels that were bored through the mountains that you have now, which make it so easy to go from the outskirts of Mecca right through to the Haram. It's so effortless now. Back then, you didn't have any of that. You had to climb mountains. And the Sheikh mentions in an interview that between his house and his Masjid, there were two um, mountains and you had to go up and come down and go up and come down each one and in between them there was no electricity at the time and there were like wild dogs and all sorts of like wild animals you know if anyone's been out there and spent extensive time out there you know it's wild dogs and scorpions and snakes and all that is is pretty normal out in the desert out there so the sheikh had to do deal with that every single day and he had to get to, the, to his class before fajr every morning otherwise his sheikh would was, he was, he was quite a strong personality um, the father, the sheikh's father was released a couple of years later and alhamdulillah he completed his hifz and he went on and he moved to Medina later on in his life. And um, 
that in skipping a couple of years, alhamdulillah, he spent a long time with his teacher, Sheikh Khalil al-Rahman. Uh, Sheikh Khalil al-Rahman is originally Kashmiri, of, of Kashmiri descent. His sons now are lead in uh, Taraweeh al-Masjid Quba and Masjid Qiblatain. And uh, mashallah, if, like, I'm not, don't want to get nationalistic or anything, but the Pakistanis are killing it when it, when it comes to the shuyukh of Qira'a in, in Medina, mashallah. Um, so he was, yeah, so he studied with him for a long time. And it was, there's a lot, it was, it was a be- you know, whenever you hear about Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub talking about his teacher, and his teacher is still alive, he's very distraught over his um, te- son's death at the moment. But alhamdulillah, he spent a long time with him. And he would go with him, travel with him city to city, and he would recite to him every single day. And it was through his love of the Qur'an and his dedication to its memorization, um, through his daily muraja'ah with his shaykh, that he really excelled in it. And his teacher held him to a very, very high and rigorous standard simply because he sought great potential in him. And so he was very strict with him. Um, I remember the shaykh mentioned, and the same thing happened with his son, that the way that they used to learn was that they would go to the shaykh, and they would, he would make his students pray nawafil and they would recite up to four juz in one sitting and the shaykh would be behind them with a stick whenever they made a mistake and sometimes if they made a mistake he'd make them start from the beginning of the surah all over again so this kind of method was, it was, it was unheard of and it was very very strict and alhamdulillah that led to the reason why mashallah the shaykh's hifd was very very strong um, and you saw that later on in, in his life when he lived in the haram um, as he graduated alhamdulillah he, he um, I think in 1410 uh, Hijri, which is I think 1990, um, the Sheikh, he had just uh, been newly appointed to Masjid Quba. And at the time, uh, the, head of, uh, the head of the Imams of Masjid Nabawi and the, the Khatibs, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Saleh, he heard, someone said to him, someone came to him and said, look, there's this new Imam in Masjid Quba, his name's Muhammad Ayyub, he's really good, you should hear him, you should check him out and see what you think. So I said, okay, yalla, call him. He told his son to call, call him. So when Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub heard about this, he got really scared because, I don't know if, the, this was in, I think this was in the late 80s, and the Sheikh was a very, very strong personality. You know, he's the kind of guy who's like, you know, if you've got a really strict father, you just hear his name, you hear him come, and you get shook. So the Sheikh was like, okay, I, I, might, I might have done something wrong. So he was really scared. So he went to the gathering where the Sheikh had invited him, and he sat right at the back where the Sheikh sort of couldn't see him like, around the corner. And the Sheikh, yeah, Abdul Aziz bin Saleh had called Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub to his gathering. And so when Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub came, he sat like around the corner from you know, right at right the back where he could barely see him. And then right towards the end of the gathering, the Sheikh Abdul Aziz was like, where's Muhammad Ayyub? Tell him to come here. So he told him, he came and he sat him down next to him and he said to him, Iqra, he said, recite. So the Sheikh was like, all right, this is all right, <laughs> okay. And by that time, obviously, the Sheikh was an accomplished, he was in his early 40s, and by then the Sheikh was a, a very accomplished Qari of the Qur'an. So, wallahi, for people like that, reciting the Qur'an is like drinking water and it's like breathing air. It's, it's, you know, it's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did what he did best. And alhamdulillah, the audience was wowed and the Sheikh was like, he was, he was taken aback. So he just whispered in his ear, he said, and this was at the end of Sha'ban. There was literally, I think, one or two days to, from the start of Ramadan. And he said, um, first night of Ramadan, you're leading a Masjid Nabawi. So you can sort of imagine, like he's a hafiz of the Qur'an, his hifth is strong, but even then being told that news, yeah, you've got one day, you're leading in the Prophet's Masjid. So you can imagine the Sheikh was like, my, I, just, I went dizzy. He, goes, he said, um, I couldn't believe what was happening. Uh, it was just a, a, an astounding moment for me. So he said he arrived on the first night in 1410, the first night of Ramadan, and uh, he stood in the mimbar. And he was very scared. He said, my, 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 he said uh, my heart was pounding, my hands were shaking uncontrollably, um, and I couldn't believe that you know, I have this responsibility of standing in the mihrab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you have to remember that if anyone who leads salah regularly, anyone who's the imam of a masjid, you know, hif of the Qur'an and your strength in memorization is one thing, but standing in front of people and reciting it is a completely different science altogether. And the two of them are totally different. Like a person, you, that's why you notice someone who's a strong hafiz of the Qur'an, can, when he stands in front of people, if he's not used to leading, he will make mistakes in small surahs. Um, and so because of this, the sheikh was very scared. And he said, astaantu billah. And then he started, he sought help from Allah and he started. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him. And in his first year in Masjid Nabawi, in the first Ramadan, he was one of the few imams, I think only two in recent history, who for the entire month of Ramadan, apart from three nights, he led all 20 rakahs of Taraweeh and Witr by himself. 
Um, and there were a couple of friends that he managed to get to come share with him on some of the nights, but each one of them after just one night pulled out and said, oh, that's it's too much for me. So all 20, for, uh, all uh, 30 nights apart from three, so 27, he led 20 rakahs by himself on his own and um, including the, uh, the, the Salat al-Witr. And he, that, that entire recording, the 1410 Muhammad Ayyub recording is found widely on the internet and it's um, it's not an exaggeration, subhanAllah, to say that it's a masterpiece of Qur'an. Anyone goes there and you listen to that masterpiece, subhanAllah. So, alhamdulillah, I think, you know, it, it, was, it was a great blessing, alhamdulillah, to meet the Shaykh many times. And every time you meet the Shaykh and you sit with him, um, he was a very stern figure. In fact, the very first time I met him and sat in front of him, he said to me in Arabic, Arabic مَاذَا تَطْلُبْ مِنِّي? You know, what do you want from me? So, so when, that, when that moment came, I just everything went out of my head. But alhamdulillah, I'm, I was close friends with the, uh, the Sheikh's family. And so they sort of took me to see him. And every time I met him, he was, just, he was a man of just um, very humble, very quiet. And you see his akhlaq were just amazing. And he was, a, sort, he was a, a, a kind of person that anyone who knew him and spent time with him knew that he really didn't have a care of the matters of the dunya. His morning till evening was involved in the Qur'an. He would teach in the Jami'ah, in the Medina University, he would teach Tafsir. And there's many, like, subhanAllah, since his passing, many of his students who studied Tafsir with him came out and told their stories and their experience with the Shaykh. Um, and they would say he was just a, a man who was just very humble. He would not excessively socialize with people, um, but if he opened up to you, he was very warm and very friendly. And he traveled over the world. He went to Brazil, he went to Turkey, he went to Pakistan. He went to India, he went to Burma, he went to Malaysia, he went to um, all sorts of countries. He did, he did Dawrat, he did uh, you know, knowledge re retreats, teaching fiqh, aqidah, teaching Quran, etc. So he was very active right until his last days. And when uh, the Sheikh, he retired, I think in 2014 from the Medina University, he had a regular hanaqa in Masjid Nabawi where accomplished hafad, strong hafad, who were all pre-tested, would come and sit and recite to him and trying to gain ijazah. And the Shaykh would insist that you had to finish the Qur'an three times to him before he would even think about giving you an ijazah. And I sat in, in a circle sometimes, only subhanAllah Allah blessed me to go meet the Shaykh ten days before he passed away. And this was, this, this was on an Umrah trip that I had not planned at all. Someone basically called me up and said, we want you to come on our group as a tour guide. And I, I refused for a long time and then something towards the end said, we might as well go ahead. So Alhamdulillah Allah took me there and it was ten days before he passed away. And we met with the Shaykh and sat with him and I was just astounded. He used to sit there and just close his eyes and he'd have four students recite to him at the same time. And each person, he would stop and correct, stop and correct, stop and correct, stop and correct. Like nothing would pass him. And that was in a noisy environment of the haram. It was sort of near the back where the umbrellas are. So he would, subhanAllah, he wouldn't. And that was in his advanced age as well. So alhamdulillah, it was, you know, it was always a pleasure to sit with the Sheikh and meet with him and, and benefit with him. And I th in my first meeting, I actually recorded a short nasiha from the Sheikh about memorization of the Quran and what advice he would give to students from the West. If you go on YouTube and type in bearers of the mighty Quran, it's all there. And I translated it and put English subtitles on it. So it's, it's very beneficial to do that, inshallah, if you, when you get some time. And, um, you know, sorry? The summary of that. Of, it, 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 was, it was just very basic. It was basically about the importance of spending a lot of time with the Qur'an, um, the importance of having motivation and um, doing, uh, dedicated to it and doing something regularly every single day and how important this is to, to, uh, to impress this upon your children also. And the Shaykh, because obviously the Shaykh is a Qari, he mentioned the importance of beautifying your recitation as well and reciting it in a way that it affects people and it, and it comes from your heart rather than simply um, reading it like a newspaper or in an, in an uninspired fashion because this is against the sunnah the prophet sallallahu said man lam bil quran falaysa minna so the person who does not recite the quran beautifully he's not of us and so that emphasizes the importance of um, that um, it was subhanallah it was the sheikh's passing it was very it was it was a difficult thing subhanallah i was i, w I was asleep and the alarm went off for fajr and i literally turned the alarm off and the message was there that a sheikh had passed away. And that was, that was the beginning of my morning. It was a really sad start to the morning, subhanAllah. And um, you know, I messaged his, his, his children and each one of them replied back saying, yes, it's true, the sheikh has passed away. And the ending of his story, subhanAllah, his, his final days is, is amazing. The sheikh, he had, he's, in, he's only done one interview in his life and it was on, it's on YouTube. It was on some Kuwaiti channel when he was out there leading salah. 
And towards the end, the presenter asked him, مَا هِيَ أُمْنِيَاتُ الشَّيْخْ مُحَمَّدْ أَيُّوبِ What are the wishes of Shaykh Muhammad Ayyub? So his very first one was, he started crying and he said, um, I pray that Allah gives me the opportunity بِالْعَوْدَ to return back to Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi to lead the people in Salah just one more time قَبْلَ أَنْ أَلْقَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَ Before I, tr- I go back to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And everyone knows that last Ramadan, uh, he was appointed back to lead Taraweeh in Masjid Nabawi and Allah fulfilled his wish. And that was the final Ramadan of his life um, before he passed away just last Saturday. So Allah fulfilled his first wish. And his second wish was to see all of his children become successful and become Hufad of the Quran. And subhanAllah, the, the, his neighbor narrates that the Shaykh, he finished his uh, circle in the Haram, then he sped off to his local masjid where he led Isha. And then after that, he attended the, the party, a, a little party, a little gathering for his youngest 12-year-old daughter, his youngest one, the final child, who had just finished memorizing the Quran. The night before, subhanAllah, the celebration, the night before he passed away. After that, he went home, went to sleep, and he woke up for at Qiyam time, as he does to pray Qiyam al-Layl. And his daughter was with him, and he's told his daughter to turn the air conditioning on because it's very hot. He was feeling very hot towards the end. After he prayed Qiyam, he went to lie down for a little bit, he fell asleep again, and his daughter came to wake him up, and he wouldn't wake up. So the Shaykh, rahimahullah, passed away in his sleep um, there. That was just before Fajr. And so I was watching a program just today where, where one of the presenters was saying it was amazing that he, the Shaykh passed away at around, the, the news got out around 7 a.m. and by Dhuhr time, they said the, the, the crowd of people in Al-Baqi, in, in the graveyard, in the courtyard, and in the haram, was like Masjid Namira on Hajj. They said that, that and this was a, a normal Dhuhr on a, on a Saturday, um, which isn't, which wouldn't be as packed. So literally the courtyards, the haram, they said even some of the children of the Sheikh couldn't even get into the graveyard because they closed the graveyard off because of the amount of people in there. And uh, I think the ulama and shuyukh and qurra from all over the world were, have been, since his passing away, have been pouring in with their praises. And he was one of those people that no one had anything bad to say about. He was a man that just, he had no, in, he didn't involve himself in much of the dunya. He was known for his, his epic masterclass recitation. You know, people remember those seven years in Masjid and Nabawi as being some of the very best, um, you know, senior scholars have come and said that he is the best uh, imam who has ever stood in the mihrab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in current recent times. And anyone who listens to some of his, his uh, qira'a um, will, will, will see the emotional content. And I hope if I can just play if maybe about one minute of one of the sheikhs, most best, one of my favorite clips. This was from Masjid Nabawi in the year 1411 from Surah An-Nisa. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ مِنْكُمْ طَوْلًا أَنْ يَنْكِحَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ فَمِمَّا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ فَمِمَّا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ مِنْ فَتَيَاتِكُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِإِيمَانِكُمْ بَعْضُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْضٍ فَانْكِحُوهُنَّ بِإِذْنِ أَهْلِهِنَّ وَآتُوهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ مُحْصَنَاتٍ غَيْرَ مُسَافِحَاتٍ وَلَا مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْدَانٍ فَإِذَا أُحْصِنَّ فَإِنْ أَتَيْنَ بِفَاحِشَةٍ فَعَلَيْهِنَّ نِصْفُ مَا عَلَى الْمُحْصَنَاتِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشِيَ الْعَنَتَ مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْ تَصْبِرُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَيَهْدِيَكُمْ سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَنْ تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا so, SubhanAllah, you can see why everyone loved him. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So we pray that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala accepts him from the um, people of Jannah, forgives him his sins, enters him into Jannah without hisab. 
and makes this time easy for his family and for all those who love him. And inshallah, we pray that we follow the example of the Shaykh in how we love the Quran, we hold on to it, we study it, we recite it, and we impress this upon our children as he did with his children as well. Rahimahullah <laughs> ta'ala. How old was he? He was 65 years old, so he was, yeah, he was, but he was, he was quite ill. He was, he was ill for a while. But even despite his illness, every single day he would come to his classes on his own, drive there, go back to his masjid, lead Isha and Fajr. And he only stopped teaching in the Jamia up until 2014, so he was, he was active. How old was he when he completed his health? Twelve. Yeah, twelve years old. He finished it in the masjid and then finished it again in, uh, in his in India. And it's, the Sheikh has a degree in um, for a Sharia from Faculty of Sharia in Medina University. Then he did his Masters and his PhD in Medina University as well. Um, yeah, in, in, in Quran, in Tafsir. So the Sheikh was known to be very strong in Tafsir as well as being a Qari of the Quran. Shukran.